going to need a target. <laughs> Say, if I want to commit the crime of selling drugs, who are my targets? A drug addict. If I come into a community and I say, Doc, I sell dope. And Doc say, I don't get high. And walk off. And I come to Brother Minister Raheem and I say, I sell dope. And he say, no, I don't even get high. He walk off. They are silent partners. They ain't confronting me. They make it safe for me to ask somebody else. Now I come across a brother, and he said, yeah, give me a bag. And I done found my target. And I come to a sister, and she said, yeah, give me a bag. And then somebody come around to me and say, I heard you got a bag. <laughs> so now that I did, I'm the motivated defender. I done identified my target. Now see, there's an opportunity here because there's no guardianship. See, the guardianship became the silent partner by saying, no, I don't get out. And then confront me. Say that. But see, if I come to the guardianship and I say, hey, I sell dope, then the guardianship say, I don't get high, but you need to know a little right there, and I got some children. You can't do that around here. So everybody I go to give me that same message, then what's happening? They done took away my opportunity. They limited my possibility of having a target, right? That's right. So I got to move around. So crime, in a sense, is not an isolated thing. So we can't point the finger at the system or the white man. When the last time you heard of a white guy come breaking your house? <laughs> what do that burglar look like? Come on, come on. When the last time you saw a white guy stand on your block and say, rocks and blow? <laughs> what do that guy look like? <laughs> and see, who's the relatives of that guy that say, rocks and blow? The very people that written those buildings or owning those homes. But one thing about our environment is where there are, and let me say this thing. I learned this from uh, one of our elders, uh, Congressman Danny Davis. My wife gave me some kind I can't, I ain't got my glasses. What does that mean? I got three minutes? Yeah. Is that what that means? <laughs> three minutes? Three minutes? Oh, let me say this right now. America make up 5% of the world population, 5%. But America house 25% of the incarcerated population, the world incarcerated population. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Out of all the people that's locked up in the world, America has 25% of them locked up. Here in Illinois, there's over, the set, there's over 70% of the people in Illinois prison that are repeated offenders. These are the people that go in and out of prison. But where do those people come from? Five communities in Chicago. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? So let's look at what we call social disorganization. Mm -hmm. Social disorganization. What do that community look like? One is a transit community. People don't stay there too long. People are constantly there. But these are the kind of people that rent and move every other year, every other six months. That's right. So there's no investment in the community. That's right. See, right. and these are the communities that drug dealers target. Tell it, tell Criminals it. target. Tell it. This is the kind of community you can walk up on a guy that seems like bootleg movies is legal. Tell it. <laughs> or marijuana is legal. <laughs> because there's no guardianship. Come on, man. See, these are the kind of communities where employment opportunity has been depleted where schools lack certain resources, and then it's overcrowdedness. See, these kind of conditions bring about, give birth to violence, crime, gains, everything, right? So when you live in a community where there's resources, right, where there's proper uh, uh, resources, people are housed properly, clothed properly, Right? And, and the resources are there. You find a community where there is a community and people get along with it. Right? Tell it. Tell it. You know, but when you find a community oh when it's depleted of resources, like the west side of Chicago where I come from, I'm one of the first black families to move into Austin area. As a little boy, we had to fight other ethnic groups just to go swimming at Columbus Park. 
that Lake Street had factories from, uh, from Oak Park down to downtown, factories. Where you get a job, we had Zenith in Austin, Motorola, Goodman's, Western, all this, you know, but the community meant to play up and say this and set it up. B.F. Skinner, a sociologist, he did a study with some rats where he put them in this box. And he had a reward and punishment system in this box. So this box became these rats' new environment. So they knew if they do certain things, they get rewarded. If they do certain things, they get punished. So he was controlling their behavior. See, these rats start acting different than regular rats. These rats develop a conscious different from regular rats. Our community has reward and punishment systems. Most communities, Fourth Amendment rights are respected. See, the Fourth Amendment says probable cause for search and seizure. Police can't just, if the police stop you for a traffic, then that's the line of questioning he have to come with. License, you broke a traffic rule. If he asks to go search your car, you got a right to say, officer, I don't consent to a search. That's your fault of the right. If he go in your vehicle, it's no different than he coming into your home without a search warrant. Because your vehicle is private property. If you're a woman, he go in your purse without your consent. That's a violation of your fourth amendment right because your purse is a property property. Or your pockets. You see it all the time. But the justification in court is in these five communities that make up the majority of the people in our prison system, the justification is that this is a high crime rate area. Oh, that's excuse. So everybody is vulnerable. Mm, right. Everybody is a suspect. <laughs> so it becomes normal for them to just go in your pocket. Mm. Just say shut up and get up against the hood and just search your car. Right. That becomes a normal practice. See, we don't have a guardianship in our community. That's right. The right. challenge is that. Say that. Say that. When the last time you seen a major protest in Chicago? Right. <laughs> or when was the last time you saw a riot in the prisons in Illinois? Because see, the same conditions that cause a person to commit a crime to go to prison, they face with those same conditions in prison. No jobs. State bills in prison with over 2,000 inmates, but state bills only have about 110 jobs. Over 80% of the people in Stateville don't have a high school diploma, but they got a GD program that can only serve maybe 80 people at one time. Overcrowded schools and the prisons. See, so a brother find himself fighting for the same issues in prison that he fought for on the streets. See, but see, brothers ain't coming together and organizing because there's no guardianship. If we do what we do here, do we really have a backing of the community? Right. So they become passive. I got caught up in a riot in 1978 in Pontiac Prison. Three guards got killed. Governor Thompson at the time came down and Charles Rowe, who was the director of the Illinois Department of Corrections at the time. And they both said that this riot is a year late. Why? Because this prison was designed to house 600 inmates. And the day of the riot, it was over 2,000 inmates. That they had received so many petitions and complaints, even from officers, that was up under pressure and stress because of the condition they had to work on. That was a violation of what you call a Duran decree. That's a decree that says all superintendents of prisons got a, 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 a an option when they find certain conditions that might lead to a riot that they can resort to to minimize the possibility. But they didn't do that in this case. So as a result, they investigated the riot and it went from a spontaneous overcrowded condition to a game takeover. <laughs> and so they indicted me and 16 other brothers that had high ranking positions with street games at that time. <laughs> And three guards got killed, but we were each charged with 15 counts of murder, two attempt murder, and mob action. And I was kind of tough. 
<laughs> but when I went in front of that judge in Pontiac Prison, when a riot happened in that small little town that I knew we got to pull a jury from, and Judge uh, Miller said, Mr. Lee, you got a 